a mystical wizard battling an evil dragon, a young hero riding atop a snow beast. This is the stuff of which fantasy films are made. But the magic used to create many of Hollywood's fantastic creatures is a painstaking, labor-intensive technique called stop-motion animation. The first great master of the craft was Willis O'Brien, whose genius gave birth to a superstar named King Kong. O'Brien's protege, Ray Harryhausen, thrilled audiences with his mythological creatures, taking stop-motion animation to new heights. Inspired by the work of O'Brien and Harryhausen, a young animator named Phil Tippett has carried on the tradition, helping pioneer such technological advances as Go Motion. Today, we'll meet the masters of stop-motion animation and visit a world where movie magic is created one step at a time. shooting a 150 frame shot, which is about six seconds long, uh, that could take uh, sometimes six, seven, eight, 10, 12 hours, depending upon how, uh, how complicated the scene was. Stop motion animator Phil Tippett has brought some of Hollywood's most unusual characters to life for movies like Coneheads, the Robocop films, and Return of the Jedi, for which he received an Academy Award. Stop motion animation is the technique of photographing miniature puppets in a series of still frames. When projected at the standard film speed of 24 frames per second, persistence of vision takes over and the puppet appears to take on a life of its own. For the animator, it is an intensive process. The puppet's body and limbs are moved in very small increments and then a single frame of film is exposed to record the image with absolute concentration to ensure that all the joints are moving in the desired direction with the desired momentum, the animator repeats the process for each frame. I found that yeah, after finishing a shot, you're so focused on this particular thing, you step out, you finish your shot and download the camera and... <laughs> Come on, you gotta drive home, you know, you gotta wake up now. Stop motion animation actually dates back to the earliest days of film. In 1909, director J. Stewart Blackton animated matches, cigarettes, and other smoking paraphernalia in the short comedy Princess Nicotine. But a young man from Oakland, California, named Willis O'Brien, would soon elevate stop-motion animation from a film gimmick to a mainstay of American cinema. O'Brien made his first film in 1915. It took him two months to complete the five-minute melodrama the Dinosaur and the Missing Link. O'Brien would later refer to this ape man as King Kong's ancestor. He was one of the pioneers of stop motion. He was the first one to really apply it to something uh, spectacular. O'Brien's first full-length feature, The Lost World, was indeed spectacular. The amazing sight of realistically moving dinosaurs astounded audiences and made it 1925's box office phenomenon. Inside each dinosaur puppet was a steel skeletal armature consisting of about 100 joints. O'Brien designed the armatures himself and hired a talented young artist named Marcel Delgado to construct the movie's 50 creatures. In some of the scenes, they, they have a stampede where the jungle's are fire and the dinosaurs are fleeing, and he's got most of them in some of those. In 1930, O'Brien began to work on an RKO Pictures film entitled Creation. In a test reel, 
he debuted the results of a new system for integrating his miniature figures with live action photography. This real projection system allowed O'Brien to project previously shot live action film one frame at a time and then re-photograph it off a screen incorporated into the miniature set. Additional background scenery could be painted on one or more panes of glass on the camera side of the screen and made to blend in with the rear projected image and foreground miniatures. With minor variations, O'Brien was to use this system for the rest of his career. In 1931, RKO abruptly pulled the plug on creation, but producer Marion C. Cooper, impressed by the test reel, hired O'Brien to supervise special effects on a movie about a giant ape, tentatively entitled The Eighth Wonder. At first, uh, the idea was to make him sort of a half man and half ape. It came out uh, very badly. A second, more simian version of the leading character was also rejected by Cooper. But the third try, completely devoid of human features, was approved. The creature and the movie also received a new name, King Kong. O'Brien designed Kong's 18-inch tall steel armature. This is the original, over which Marcel Delgado used flexible rubber, cotton, liquid latex, and rabbit pelts to fashion the great ape. But more than anything else, it was O'Brien's precise and imaginative stop-motion animation that infused Kong with character. Willis O'Brien had been a uh, boxer among other things. And Kong himself, his uh, fighting is almost human at times. For instance, he goes after his opponent's head. You try to get him by the head and stop him from chewing you up. Kong does that. One of O'Brien's greatest strengths was his attention to detail. And you know where Kong brings the girl into the cave? He's got bubbling water. He's got the wake and the head of the sea creature swimming around in this water. He's got steam rising off of this. You can't imagine the amount of work to go into that scene, and all of for the sake of making it that much more convincing. It took O'Brien and a small crew over a year to animate King Kong, but his tremendous labor paid off when the movie opened in 1933 breaking box office records and inspiring a new generation of effects artists. While King Kong inspired many future filmmakers, perhaps no one was more affected than 13-year-old Ray Harryhausen. The film struck a note in me that uh... I just couldn't get it out of my mind. I didn't know how it was done at the time. And uh, I, I felt I must discover this because I knew it wasn't a man in a suit. So I found out about the glories of stop motion animation, which was kept very secret at that time. With a 16 millimeter camera and a puppet fashion from his mother's fur coat, young Harryhausen set to work on his first amateur film, which he entitled The Cave Bear. He continued developing his animation skills, producing several short dinosaur films, and soon got the chance to meet his idol, Willis O'Brien. Oh, we told him to um, bring his work and come up to our house sometime soon, which he did, and brought his mother and dad and, and his uh, portable screen and ran a bit of the film. I just patted him on the back and praised him, and after they left, Obi looked at me sort of strangely, and he said, you realize you're encouraging my competition, don't you? Harry Hausen's first professional job came right after high school, animating characters for George Powell's Puppetoons. Later, he produced his own series of educational short films based on Mother Goose stories. Then, in 1946, he got a call from O'Brien, who was assembling a team for a new Kong-type feature. Of course, that was a big thrill of my life, was to, uh, uh, to work with them on uh, another gorilla picture. So uh, 
I had uh, two and a half to three years with Willis O'Brien working on Mighty Joe Young. Harryhausen designed Mighty Joe's armature. 16 inches tall, it was built with 150 moving parts, machined from aluminum. Compared with the Kong armature, Joe is only two inches shorter, but considerably lighter and more dexterous. Working under O'Brien's tutelage, Harryhausen accomplished about 85% of the stop-motion animation in the film. He spent many days at the zoo studying gorilla behavior, determined to give Joe a distinct personality. And you have to do that by putting little nuances, and a lot of that is created on the set. You can uh, plan it in a general sense with a storyboard, but all the little details you put in as one pose suggests another pose. While never equaling King Kong in popularity, Mighty Joe Young is considered by many to be technically superior. And in 1949, Willis O'Brien's work on the film was recognized with an Academy Award. For Ray Harryhausen, Mighty Joe Young was just the beginning. In a collaboration that spanned four decades, he and producer Charles Schneer brought ancient mythology to life. Jason and his band of Argonauts, the mightiest warriors the world of adventure has ever known, in search of the fabulous magic golden fleece. Harryhausen gave stop-motion animation a popular mystique when he coined the term Dynamation. Audiences were enthralled with his incredible features, unaware of the almost superhuman effort that went into bringing them to life. Kill, kill, kill them all! For the climax of Jason and the Argonauts, Harryhausen animated seven sword-wielding skeletons in one of the most complex stop-motion sequences ever. He was able to average only 13 frames a day, taking four and a half months to complete this scene. One of Harryhausen's favorite characters is Medusa, who appears in Clash of the Titans. For each frame, he had to manipulate and keep track of the more than 200 joints in her head and body. Today, Ray Harryhausen is recognized as a grand master of stop-motion animation. Since the 1940s, his artistry has packed theaters with audiences who came for one reason, to marvel at his mythological movie magic. I'm particularly pleased when some people who are not in the business come up and say that you made my childhood. One man even said, my grandfather took me to see your picture. So it made me feel like 102, but uh, it's a thrill to think we made more than just an entertaining film. It affected people's lives, and I think that's what films do. Right now, this character's got to walk into the scene and actually start eating these apples off the tree and then exit the scene. Because the basic the process of stop-motion animation is still practiced in much the same way as it was in the days of Willis O'Brien and Ray Harryhausen. At Kyoto Brothers Productions in Burbank, Kim Blanchett is animating this megatherium, a prehistoric sloth-like animal for a television commercial. This point, pointer, is actually my reference point on how much I've moved the puppet. But while traditional stop-motion animation tools like the surface gauge are still used, today's animators have a distinct advantage over their predecessors. In recent years, they can utilize video cameras mounted alongside the film camera, which freeze and store the previously exposed frame. Okay, I got it. After 410 exposed frames, the animation sequence is ready for review. While taking Kim several days to complete, this 16-second film clip is considered a first attempt. Kim and animation director Steve Kyoto will now begin to fine-tune the creature's movements. So what the director wants to do, the eating is fine, the walking out is fine, everything's fine. They just want to work on the, the entrance, the style of the walking. They think he walks a little too light-footed. Claws are so big that they want the feet to bend a little bit. 
inward, so he's walking on the inside, the outside of his feet, and then drag the feet as much as you can to make them look heavy. After making sure he has the right moves with his own body, Blanchette is ready to animate the entire sequence again. Frame by frame, he infuses the megatherium with the desired gait and personality. At the center of recent technological advances is a leading contemporary stop-motion animator, Phil Tippett. In his Berkeley, California studio, Tippett designs heroes and villains for some of Hollywood's most popular films. My main inspiration came in 1950, what was it, three or four, I think, or five, when King Kong came on television. And in 58, I saw Harry House and Seven Forge of Sinbad. I just fell in love with the, the, the surreality of the, of the objects moving themselves. I had no idea what, what generated them, but it was just you know, kind of a passionate fixation. An original member of George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic, Tippett, along with ILM colleague John Berg, was put in charge of the stop-motion animation department for The Empire Strikes Back. Their first challenge was to design and animate the giant Imperial walkers. The story called for the walkers to march across a snowy plain. The snow was simulated on the miniature set by baking soda. That could be a big problem, particularly if you had a cold and were sneezing, <laughs> because it had a tendency to you know, blow your set away, or if you made the wrong kind of move, or, or if you forgot what you were doing and put your elbow down, your elbow would disturb the set. We had made like little trap doors that we could crawl into the set and open up the trap doors that had perfect feathered edges on them, and we'd get up and animate the puppets and close the you know, trap doors back down, and they'd take a frame of film and open up the trap doors and animate the puppets. The imposing walkers were animated in extremely minute increments in order to give them a slow, lumbering gait. At the opposite end of the movement spectrum were the fleet-footed snow beasts called tauntauns. And we shot a great deal of uh, reference footage of, of horses, you know, looking at the, the characteristics. What I tend to do on any given character is begin to build up a book of notes that can be pretty extensive. And then once it comes down to initiating the performance or actually doing the animation, take that book and drop it in the trash and, and just get on with the business of, of animating the thing. Because the Tauntauns had to move quickly, the effects team wanted to replicate the motion blur seen in live action photography of fast moving objects. For example, in looking at footage of a dog running, the dog will appear blurred in each individual frame. With traditional stop motion animation, the moving object maintains clearly defined edges in each frame of film. The absence of motion blur results in the slight strobing effect characteristic of stop motion. For the Tauntaun shots, the puppet was moved slightly along a motion control track with each opening of the camera shutter. This first use of motion blur involved only forward momentum. But Tippett's next project, Dragon Slayer, brought motion blur to all the creature's movements. While Tippett designed the dragon itself, engineer Stuart Ziff built a complex motion control system he called the Dragon Mover. Ziff's invention consisted of six motor-driven rods, one for each leg, one to move the body, and one to control the head and neck. Tippett's animation of the dragon was programmed into a computer which controlled the system. The process successfully added motion blur to all the creature's movements and gave rise to a new term, Go Motion. There was an additional benefit to having all the complex moves of an animation sequence stored in the computer. The development of this go motion um, process and th that began on Empire really allowed us to start thinking about refining the, the performance. You wouldn't really bother ever shooting a final shot until you had the entire performance worked out. The result was the most horrifyingly believable dragon ever to strafe the screen. of fast-moving technological advances, Tippett continues to work with the eyes and hands of a stop-motion animator. As dinosaur supervisor on Jurassic Park, he transmitted his stop-motion skills into the computer, 
providing the animation for many key scenes, which were then rendered as computer-generated imagery. Ultimately, no matter what tool you're using, whether it's stop motion, go motion, computer graphics, uh, you're learning how to work with the limitations of the tools that you have. You have a, a mental image in your mind of what the thing should be moving like, and you're, you're constantly moving. No, it shouldn't be like that. It should be like this. And just trying to you know, keep all this stuff moving towards what you, you know, see in your mind's eye. As they continue to create movie magic one step at a time, Phil Tippett and a handful of other effects artists are carrying on the legacy of the pioneers of stop-motion animation. Willis O'Brien started and I tried to follow with the uh, concept that we're using stop-motion photography for our leading characters. Now when you think of King Kong, a mass of, of metal with rabbit fur and uh, sponge rubber on it, not a real person, his name is up there in lights with Greta Garbo, Clark Gable. He's part of Hollywood legend. Ladies and gentlemen, look at 